how can you help the player or players regarding the planning you're doing and the reviewing? I was striker, striker until my, my 23s. So I would slowly build it up from the usual one touch off and shift. Welcome to the Daily Coaching Football Show, where we talk football, insight, player and coach development. My name is David Webb and I'm your host. And today with me, I have guest coach with me, Sherlyn. Um, Sherlyn, thank you very much for taking the time to join me today. I'm really excited to have you with me on this discussion. If you can, introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers and let them know a little bit about you. Again, thank you very much, David, for having me this morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Sherlyn Lindsay. Um, I'm a football coach. I work... Well, I should say, yep, I, my current role is at Fulham Football Academy in the foundation phase. I'm an age group coach. I've been coaching for 10 years plus now. And I've also worked at different development centres such as Arsenal and Crystal Palace and had many years experience in grassroots football for great football clubs such as Junior League in South London. So that's my history there on that. Fantastic. No, listen, really, uh, it is an honour and a pleasure to have you on today. And I think that your experiences are going to be vital to um, the different discussions which we've got coming up. So without further ado, let's get into the first section of the show, which is discussion of the week. So for the first part of the show, we've got discussion of the week, and that's where we discuss a certain topic. We look at the positives and negatives, and we kind of just have an overall discussion um, based on that phrase or that um, outcome. So for this week's discussion of the week, we have how important is plan, do, review, and is one stage more important than any of the others? So Sherlyn, straight over to you. For you, what is plan, do, review, and how often do you use plan, do, review in your coaching? I think planning doing it and reviewing is quite essential uh, for me personally within my coaching. I think even when I was in grassroots, it's something that you kind of get guided towards in your coaching education. And I think personally as a coach, you need to have that, that view in mind whenever you're planning a session or whether it's by yourself or with your fellow peers and so on. So I think it's, it's, it's quite essential to have it. And I mean, my view on what's planning, doing and reviewing, it's basically you're, you've got a picture. Yeah. How can you draw that picture? And that picture can involve visually and verbally too. And you could have your own ideas, but also try to implement your fellow coaches that you may be working with ideas as well. But I think the essential part in that is how can you help the player or players regarding the planning, the doing and the reviewing? So that's where we'll come from, what plan and doing a review is, is, is about. Yeah, no, 100%. It, it's interesting because I'll be honest with you, when I first started out within coaching, my main priority, and I say priority is, you know, only because of what I was kind of brought up around in the environments that I was within and um, what was seen as the main focus was, mine was purely only the doing. You know, I, I, obviously I knew the planning was 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 needed, um, but obviously yeah. when you first start out within coaching, you almost get given um, like booklets or sort of like pre, pre-planned session plans. And you just, yeah. wow, this is gold. You know, I've got given a session plan, brilliant. It, it's a bit of a tick box. It gives me something to do in the session. But obviously as later time's gone on and as I've kind of, you know, really gone into my own in say, for example, the last five or six years, every session has to be planned separately. Even in regard as if I'm doing, say, for example, a same structure as I may have done particularly within a different session or, or previously, the planning that goes into that is, you know, what technical outcomes I'm going to try and bring out, what psychological, what social, what physical. And mm-hmm. the session may look the same, but actually the outcomes are completely different. For you, when did you first kind of have that sort of thought process as well, that it wasn't just a session which you was delivering, but actually the planning has to be so accurate and, and particular um, and obviously how important reviewing is as well of how it's gone almost. I think, just I can think of two occasions. I think when I was doing my um, youth mods and when I actually entered that, that course, I think that opened my eyes to so many different things. Because similar to most coaches where when you decide to become a coach, you know, what even I'm couldn't again, I'm talking about myself. A lot of it was down to the ego. And I think if we all look inside of us, we all have a have an ego. Yeah. But it's how you shape that ego. So my first view was planning, and it was always about planning. It wasn't even necessarily about doing, because the doing factor, I used to always watch different coaches I would see on the internet or different sessions. I think, well, I can take that and bring it to my environment. 
But I then, when I did my youth award, it was, you, you can't do that, Shirley. You've got to become the best version of yourself. So then I scrapped the idea about, it's all about the planning. It then became more essential for me about the reviewing. And I think as I've got to this stage of my coaching journey so far, the planning and the doing, it's a nicety for me. Yeah. Because I, I, I look at how can I design a session or what am I going to do during a session? I find that a lot more easier now compared to the reviewing, because I put a lot of focus in the reviewing. I've got to review my sessions with my fellow colleagues or even majority of the time by myself. What could I have done differently to help that player? Not what could I have done differently to help myself in the, in the session, whereas probably that's where I would have come from when I first started my journey. Because we all wanted to be the next Jose Mourinho, the next Pep. Do, do, do you know what I mean? You know, Now it seems to be I want to be the next Klopp and so on and, and so on. And I think even along during my journey, working with coaches of different qualifications, whether it's A license, B license, or, you know, FA level one or two, I'm always of the way of thinking, let's talk about what we could have done to help the players better. Not how great our session was, because really and truly, we're not the ones in the session. It's the actual players that's in the session. So the reviewing factor, you get to sit down amongst people and talk about the ideas that we all had. Did it work for the players? Did it not work for the players? What could we have done better? And I find that the reviewing factor of plan do review, it helps you plan and actually do better for future sessions. So similarly, when you're talking about, you could have the same design, but the outcomes are going to be different every single time. And not just because you're given different progressions or constraints, but you're going to prepare for having too many players sometimes. Sometimes you can have less players and, if you can learn to, to focus and adapt to that, then once you do the reviewing, you know you've got a plan A, B, and C. So that's why I would say the review factor for me is where I really focus on that and really enjoy, even more so than actually planning yeah. and more sort of doing. So, yeah, that's, that's when I think, yeah, when I did my youth mods, it really kicked in for me that it was about the players, not the could I design a great session. I'm not involved in it. If the players enjoy it, then it's a great session. If the players learn from it, it's a fantastic session. If the players contribute to it, hey, it's a phenomenal session. So for me personally, the reviewing factor, getting the feedback from your coaches and the players, that's the key part for me. Yeah, no, 100%. And, and, and even just listening to you and, and, and how you bring your points across, I can tell automatically you're a coach of a growth mindset. And I think what's... Oh, absolutely. You need to have a growth mindset because ultimately, I'll be honest with you, it's all very similar when I worked at the FA, that was the first time that I actually got eluded to this whole plan do review. Now, let's be honest, it's probably something which has always been there, but yeah. just by three key words, it automatically triggers you thinking in a certain way um, and also reflects that there is importance within each of these different stages. And I think really and truthfully, like we were saying about you may have similar design sessions or, or session designs or the session may look the same. That's from the outside and from potentially a player or parent perspective. But the only person who's going to know the detail and information that goes into that, obviously until you relay that to the players, is you as a coach. So really yeah. and truthfully, that's why the emphasis is so on the coaches to do that. But what's an interesting point is that when I think of this, like, don't get me wrong, I, I, I incredibly think it's important to do this. However, when I mentor a lot of coaches, um, I know when I've gone down to coaching sessions and I've, I've said, like, you know, can you send me a plan prior to me going down? And very rarely do they actually have, the, you know, they say it's up there, but unfortunately I can't get into their brain. Up here. But they say to me, well, no, I've, I've just thought of it, you know, and it, it, it's in my head and I'm just going to relay it. And in a way, like, it frustrated me as obviously the mentor because I thought to myself, well, you know, how can I really understand what your session's for and, and what you're trying to achieve? But in a way, I had to kind of relate to them because their point of view was that, you know, there was working typically within a grassroots setting and they was like, well, I'm only getting paid for the hour that I'm down here. So... Okay. You know, other than that, I've got other priorities. And I know it sounds a bit harsh because ultimately when you're a coach, listen, there's, you've got to understand unsociable hours and a lot of commitment other than what your pay bracket includes. But yeah. I kind of got it. I kind of got it that actually they are only getting paid for the delivery of that session. And don't get me wrong, if you're delivering it correctly, you're putting in the work and the effort and, and the time. But what's your thoughts on sort of the whole thing around, you know, 
how coaches are paid in terms of, you know, they're typically paid just for the delivery and not necessarily the planning and doing and how much emphasis is kind of neglected on that almost should be put on yeah. it. That's, 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 an, that's an interesting one. Um, I can see from both sides. Yeah. And I think when I look at when I was in grassroots and obviously volunteering, my mindset has always been football is my passion. So if I have an opportunity to work in it, whether obviously at that time it was unpaid, it was a case of having, like you said, that growth mindset. If I'm working amongst people that are there and, and have done it for so many years before me and have, you know, fantastic ideas and feedback and experiences that I can pull on, it was all about developing myself. So I spent many years volunteering. And I've been honest with you, David, I never thought about the pay factor, yeah. which is quite, quite crazy, you know, probably what some people would think. But because it was football, it, you know, as a kid, you know, always having that football in your hands and then being able to work with young people on the field and, and help them become the best version of themselves on the field, I never thought about the pain. So when it came to the planning, you know, yes, it was hours away from the grass. And don't get me wrong, I, I always had a full-time job and I had to fit that in and so on. But I always thought, spend some time during the week, put aside some time. And the time you're putting aside is taken away from, you know, when you're relaxing a bit. So take an hour or two from your relaxing time during the week and put it into your planning. And the only reason why I used to do that, and probably still do that now, even getting paid, is that it was always going to help me grow as a coach. And if I'm growing as a coach, I'm able to guide these, help guide these players to become better versions of themselves. And like I said, taking the experience from, you know, my, my peers in grassroots, it was, it was invaluable to me. It was just, it was, it was something that I didn't think of. I never thought, oh, I'm up on a Saturday morning again. I'm not getting paid. I just thought I'm going to, to experience football again. I'm not playing it no more, but I'm getting a bigger buzz by working with young people and seeing the enjoyment I had many, many years ago. So I do understand the financial aspect. Uh, some coaches may see it as I'm only here to deliver a session. But if the, and, and, I, and I have totally respect for that. But if you see yourself going to a different stage as a coach, as you get, as you grow, not necessarily in age, but if you think, right, I would like to go from grassroots to development or development to academy or even opening my own one-to-one -one center or a development center, you've got to put that extra growth into what you want to do and try to ignore certain aspects that may not be so great at the moment, but think of the bigger picture. Because it's one thing that I do tend to tend to tell players, think of the bigger picture. Don't just think about the position you play in. Think about the other positions that affects around you. So I also sit, carry that same train of thought when it comes to my coaching. So getting paid wasn't essential for me back then. And it still isn't essential for me to now. Don't get me wrong. It helps like anything else does when you're getting paid. But because football has always been my passion, I never gave the money factor a second thought. It was only when... Now I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting paid for this. It's great. I can plan for a bit more on a personal level. But I also do understand some coaches journey where they feel I've got this stress or I've got this job. And so everybody is slightly different. So I do respect where some coaches come from, but my personal journey, I never give a second thought about the financial aspect. Yeah, no, I'm saying you pick up some great points there about sort of like, you know, you, you, yes, there is that element of, you know, you, some people do think about the finances, but ultimately I kind of think to myself as well, like everything that I do, I always think it's a knock on effect. Everything that I do, I try and put pride in doing. And, you yeah. know, I kind of think to myself that if I put pride in what I'm doing, it's a reflection, say, for example, on the organization or the company that I'm working for. And I think ultimately, if I do put pride in what I'm doing, then it's going to be more of an effective and whatever effective is, because it is quite a loose term, but it's going to be more of an effective um, or beneficial session for the players. But then like you mentioned as well, for you as well, I think like you said, as coaches, obviously don't get me wrong, wrong the, 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 the forefront of what we do is the players and, and the player that we're working with. But ultimately we're learning every day as well. Um, and it's interesting yeah. when I have conversations with um, like professional players and I say to them when they're thinking about going into coaching, I say, you've got to know what you're talking about. 
because it's one thing understanding and knowing football, but children, they will pick up on anything that you say. And, and for example, I mean, I've been involved in football for the last 13 years now, but there's children who will be a lot more experienced within coaching environments than myself because they have coaches coming to schools. They have coaches which they go to see at teams or recreational sessions. They have a whole range of different coaches. I'm just one individual. And yes, I try and take away as much as I can from any level of coach or any setting which a coach is in. But ultimately, they know so much. So I think, yeah, you have to take pride in what you do and really try and take the time and detail within your planning of, of, of what's going to happen. But you picked up on another great point as well about sort of the environment. And I think often, you know, it's not to bad mouth grassroots, but typically when you see a grassroots setting, if there's more than one coach with that same mindset, and there's typically a younger coach coming into that environment, they will typically copy what's happening around them. You know, Absolutely. that's all they know. And, and that's no disrespect to them because they're just picking up on the things around them. For you, when you went from grassroots into more of an elite or academy type setting, what was the emphasis on there? Because obviously you've always had that growth mindset, which honestly, truthfully, is pretty rare in coaches when they're coming through the sort of different systems. But when you came into these more advanced settings, was there more of an emphasis from these clubs to say, look, this is actually something which, yeah, we, we do anyway that you need to promote, really? I, I've been very blessed so far when it comes to going from grassroots to obviously where I'm currently at Fulham now. And again, going from the grassroots clubs that I've worked at, you know, like I said, I've worked at good ones, especially in, in South and like my old one, Junior Elite, where the mindset was, it's all about developing as a strong coach, a strong coach in the areas that the players need you for. And I've taken that same mindset from working there and having that within me naturally. And then the environment that I'm in now, I don't think I could be in a more stronger environment for myself personally, where the people I work with and work under, it's all about pushing the coach to the best version that they can be while they're at the club. Because if you then become the best version of yourself and you're working with people who have the same mindset and just want to pull you up with, you, with them at the same time, not keep you at your level, they, they want to help you grow. It's almost like they're my water can and I'm the tree that's growing. You know, it's, it's a bit cheesy to say, but that's how I see it. And I think I've always been the type of person to surround myself with people with a similar mentality, but also with a stronger growth, because I never want to be the smartest person in the room. You know, I, that means I'm never going to learn. So where I currently am now, the transition from grassroots to uh, elite academy football has been very much smooth sailing for me, because Again, I've been surrounded from grassroots to elite football with the same growth mindset of each person that I work with. So it was quite easy for me. And like I said, very blessed to go from one area of football to the elite area of football. So, yeah, I've been quite fortunate on that level. Yeah, no, no, it's fantastic as well. Again, another point to pick up on there about sort of your peers around you. Because obviously, as I said before, like, you know, typically you, you do kind of, especially if you're new to coaching, you'll pick up on, or even say new to coaching, if you're new within a certain environment. Because ultimately, you know, we've coached various different players in different environments and settings. But obviously, as we know, different clubs, different settings will have different ways of working and different philosophies and what I mean by that is not necessarily playing philosophies but you know different ways of developing players different um, end goals of what they're trying to achieve with um, each individual player or or if even they're trying to do that if they're maybe just trying to push players onto more higher advanced um, environments or, or, or teams but I think that, that the point made there about sort of like you know being around those positive um, strong-minded, open-minded, growth mindset um, and knowledgeable characters, I think is crucial because ultimately as well, you kind of pick up on certain ways in which they do things. Like I remember when I first started doing this whole planning, doing reviewing um, element of, of, of coaching, I would spend so long doing it. And that was probably because I didn't understand, say how to be clever with it, and it's not to cut corners, but how you can bring out these different stages in different outcomes. Um, so obviously, I used to think to myself, you know, you, you stand around at the start of the session, you explain what your plan is throughout the whole session. Well, whilst I'm waffling on for five minutes, I've already lost the players' attention. Then at the <laughs> yeah. end of the session, when I'm trying to review it, 
And I think typically that's my way of reviewing the session. You know, again, I'm waffling on for five or 10 minutes. The players are thinking, looking at their watches, can I go home yet? Like, you know, it's not the appropriate time. So as time's gone on, I've got a little bit more savvy with the way in which I do my planning, my, my do what he's doing, you'll do it actually when you're out on the field, but, and you're reviewing. And for me, one of the things, things I picked up on is the reviewing element. I was like, well, I don't really have no time to do it. And especially if you're a coach where you do a session, then you go on to another session or you do a session and you've got to get home and spend time with the family. For me, the reviewing came part of like an audio so it would be, I record it on the way back whilst I'm driving, um, obviously hands-free. <laughs> <Spot out there. laughs> I'd record it whilst I'm, I'm, I'm driving back. Um, and then I would listen to it two times throughout the week. Once when I'm um, during the middle of the week, so I've had a bit of time to be able to let the session sink in, um, thinking about what I'm doing. And then once before I do that, the next session, just so that I can pick up on any of the key points. For you, what's some of the ways in which you actually do plan your sessions um, and then do review your sessions as well? Is it always a typical thing of writing things down or is it some of these other creative ways? My planning has always stemmed from my crazy vision, as I like to call it. And when I say crazy vision, I visualise total chaos on yeah. the pitch and then plucking from that total chaos elements that are important for the players that I'm working with. So I, you know, it's weird to say, but I always envisualize, you know, tons of people kicking tons of footballs. Okay, who's the calmer ones? Take them out of the session. My session needs to be calm amongst the chaos. Who's the intelligent ones who are not constantly running unnecessarily? Okay, take that out. Put a bit of, you know, self self awareness for the players. Okay, get them involved in in the session. So I'll pick key ele- key players within whatever squads I'm working with, who I believe have a calm nature and an intelligent nature to actually help orchestrate the session how it best suits them and their teammates. So that way it takes a lot of the, as you said earlier on, the waffling at the start of the session, oh, we need to do this, oh, we need to do it. No, I've got one, two, three, four players who will talk amongst the squad to say, right, this is the plan. I'll always print it off when I've planned it, and there you go, players. I give it to them for them to read. And any questions, they quickly come back to me. There's always a designated leader, right, Coach Sherland, okay, this is this, this is what we think. Okay, cool, but we also think this. Okay, they've helped plan that, that part of the session without me planning it. So it's basically I'm I'm doing and planning at the same time as talking with them. So when it came to the reviewing, it was great because I had their instant feedback. And that wasn't necessarily at the end of the session. It was also um, during the session where you'd have those specific players coming to me saying, this is not working uh, during the training session or the games. You know, can we change this? Of course you can. You're the one that's on the field. So that way, like you said, similar to you, I would be in the car after a training session or a game and I'll record a quick four to five points of the session or the game. So because obviously I would either move on to another training session or a game or go home, like you said, and spend time with the family. And I didn't want to bring work back. So I would have those five body points recorded. So when I then leave home, I can either... As I'm walking to work, I could put it in my headphones. Okay, those are the points. And then I'll quickly record again how the session was because I find that I digest things a lot more after reflecting. But if I've got those four or five bullet points, it's helped me really like, remember, okay, this was this at this point, that was that at that point. And then I'll record my feedback as I'm free mentally in my mind to actually go, okay, this worked, that worked, this could have been better and so on. So that's how I've learned to plan with the players and review after the players have given the feedback. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And again, a couple of fantastic points picked up on there. So the element of getting the players to actually help you with the planning and the reviewing section, crucial. Like that's key. Yeah. You know, before, again, early stages of coaching, we always think as a coach, it's about us, 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 us. And well, you know, yeah. Players do the session, but we have to do the planning. We we have to do the reviewing. But actually, you know, one of the good ways of actually bringing out a review, a review is obviously a measurement of success potentially, or um, you know, the the mechanisms to support us with our next session, which is coming up. But actually, the only way to do that is through observing it through what the players have achieved or can achieve or yeah. have achieved. So I think yeah, using the players is a crucial part of that there, um, and then as well the way you kind of talked about when you're doing the um, reviewing element of it, that, yeah, I agree. Even when I first started out doing the reviewing on the phone and recording it, 
again, what did I find myself doing? Waffling. So yeah. when it comes to me, I'm like, well, I don't really want to listen to myself talk for 15, 20 minutes. Um, you know, what is actually the key point? So I think that's another great um, point to, to raise as well there, that actually when you are planning or reviewing, it doesn't have to need to be, it doesn't really need to be descriptive, but instead yeah. it needs to be informative and effective. Um, and I think that's the key thing because sometimes as coaches, we have so many different thoughts going on in our head. Well, what if we do this? When we do that, how will we do this? And ultimately the other point you picked up on was that yes you've got a group and this is what I talk to coaches all the time when I mentor them that you've got a group but ultimately as you've mentioned you've got different players within that group you know you've got yeah. some who are strivers some who are copers some who are just honestly and truthfully in between and you can almost absolutely forget about at times because you're so fixated on improving those who are struggling or challenging those who are striving ahead and it's that group in between that sometimes I have to think well you know, it's not as easy as this, but having almost easy, medium challenge, uh, easy, medium and hard sections of each part of the session, because yeah. then I kind of take it as a bit of a ladder approach that, you know, look, the easy one is obviously for those who are struggling. If you can adapt and, and, and deal with that, then go up to the medium segment of the, of the session. If you can adapt and do that well, then go up to the harder one. But actually, I'm not even having to do it. And I think you mentioned about almost having like a session at the side or um, being able to get the players to actually visualise it and see it. Yeah. Crucial points as well, because it takes away that ownership on us as coaches to always talk, 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 talk. <laughs> and yeah. give players an opportunity to learn ownership and understand it themselves almost. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 sorry, sorry, it's, it's, it's key for me because like you said, if the players are the ones that are dictating the session, we do as little talking as possible. And something that I find, I try to, I can say, blend in what the younger generation are doing today. So instead of just necessarily always printing off on paper, I would print it off on paper and I'd also use my little tablet that I have. Nice. So that way, instead of just a whole group, the whole squad looking at paper, there's some that's looking at the paper, there's some that's looking at the tablet. So the more, the more equipment, so to say, that the players can read from and learn from, it takes the stress off of us. And not so the stress, it just takes the organisation off of us and they become more, you know, ownership based around it. And then you create different types of leaders in a squad where some players either they're too shy, but then they've got the leaders to go to instead of going to the coach all the time. So there's good different varieties that you can do with the players that we should help you basically as a coach. Yeah, understand, and also levels of engagement. Because again, you know, it probably didn't take me something about two or three years to actually understand. You know, all my waffling is only being effective for about ten percent of the players, and the other yeah. guys, actually they don't like to listen to me talk. They like to see things visually, or they like to practically do things. Those kinesthetic learners. So actually, like you're mentioning there, that you know, by being able to provide different learning styles for these players ultimately your your outcome or your objective is going to be more achievable because you're presenting what you want them to do in different ways almost yeah so yeah and no, i think it, i think it's, it's, it's crucial really um, and you know for, for a player um, perspective you know and i always say this i always say that ultimately as coaches obviously we're producing players but to an extent as well what i like to try and have as a bit of an end goal is i'm almost developing the next crop of coaches so I get the players to have the understanding, the knowledge, the decision making, the problem solving, the um, team building of, you know, communicating with different people. Then ultimately what that's going to do is I'm actually giving the players, again, similar to what probably I needed as a young coach, the importance on reviewing a session, the importance and the understanding that goes behind planning a session. Because sometimes I think, especially again, when I've spoken to players, they go, well, I didn't realise how much planning goes into an actual session. I just come along to the session, I see cones laid out, you know, I'm yeah. doing what the coach is telling me to do, but ultimately it just looks like I'm playing football, which in a way is a bit of a disguise, which is an effective disguise. If we can just get the players to play football, make decisions, brilliant. But how important do you think it is for players to almost once ready, obviously, really understand the importance and the level of detail that does actually go behind the planning and reviewing as well? I think it's important, but when I say important, I wouldn't necessarily describe it to the players as 
how, how you and I or fellow coaches will talk, plan, do, review. I get them to, to understand how important it is for them as players to and just drop little things such as planning what type of boots to, to bring to training, their shin pads, get them to have that ownership for themselves. That's their planning. And then the doing factor, okay, you know, when we received the, the session plan from Coach Sherman, have we read the session plan? You know, have we got some ideas from it? You know, did I make that effort to read and visually see what I will be doing on the training field when I get to training? And then the reviewing is always taking place whilst they're actually training or, or in games. Okay, these were the objectives from Coach Sherman. These were the objectives from us as teammates. Okay, did we execute them? Why didn't we execute them? And these questions are always getting asked during the training session, this, you know, especially for me, where if we're having a small-sided game, so, so to say, during that game, instead of them constantly playing, I will break it into three or four stages where they would have a minute each, each team to discuss, okay, these are the objectives that's on the board for our team, and you know, that's the objectives for the opposition. Okay, are we counteracting it? Are we, are we mastering our objectives? So they're constantly reviewing during their training sessions without me stopping and starting. As he said, going back to that word, us as coaches waffling yeah. because they don't want to hear our voices. All they want to hear is, and play, and that's it. Yeah. And then the only voices they want to hear after that is their own. So sometimes, you know, again, depending on ages, like I said, I work in a foundation phase. So you've got under 10s, you've got under 11s, they can be having a game and they will be having words of each other. But I take those words as them reviewing what the situation is without me stepping in and saying, okay, so-and-so, you need to do this, so-and-so, you need to do that. Because as you've touched on before, we're not just developing players, we're developing future coaches. And something that we do at the club, at Fulham, is we're also developing good humans, good humans to understand that whether you play football or not, take the same work ethic, humility and honesty within what you're doing to the outside as well, because you're also representing yourself and the club. So we try to fit that into each training session, which is quite essential for those players to learn about themselves and about their teammates, because you could have three or four different groups within the squad. And that's because some know each other outside, some don't know each other outside. So having those sessions where the players are leading it by mixing different characters up, you get to see who shines through those, 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 those conversations and who that as coaches, we need to probably help guide a bit more to become a bit more talkative and creative and become a, a, a bigger leader for their sales first and foremost and to contribute towards uh, what the rest of the squad are doing. So for me, the plan they're doing is essential to in, involve the players and the reviewing. It really and truly, like I said, it allows me to have four or five points and those points are based off what those players are talking about during training. Yeah, no, 100%. And again, even with that reviewing part, like I said, most of the time the players are actually doing it, obviously, when they're, when they're performing throughout. And I know I always think of them, as coaches, typically, we always focus on the how, but actually the when, where and why is, are, for me, outweigh how. Because the how Absolutely. is a segment of it and is a movement or an action or performance that will happen, what, two, three seconds long? When is where, when and why is actually something that's happening all the time when you're off the ball. Yeah, it's, it's constant. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, that's interesting. And then even, like, again, the point you mentioned there, I mean, obviously we kind of, I suppose, typically focus on the um, planning and reviewing segments because typically, we, as coaches, we always do the doing part. But actually, what you mentioned there is crucial as well because as coaches, what we can try and do, and obviously, again, obviously, predominantly focus on the technical element, but actually, if we focus on some psychological challenges or... Um, little conditions to put in like you said giving players opportunity to be leaders well ultimately we're doing that on purpose we're doing that on purpose to set us up for that review or that might be part of a review in the previous week which we then decide you know what i want to try and give the players some more ownership this week so that i can see as a coach who is more confident who's more comfortable at speaking doing sharing ideas taking on feedback because Typically, we know as well that being from London, say, for example, there's some players where when you speak to them, they, they don't want you to tell them things. They want to show you how to do things. And, and that's yeah. as well, it comes into me about, like you mentioned, about the human characteristics and the personalities. Where 
actually that's key because they're all going to have different personalities, different characteristics, different traits. And just by a player telling you that, you know, they don't, well, they don't want to listen to you, but by not engaging in what you're saying, that actually they might even prefer just to go out there and show you. So yeah. I think, yeah, it, it, it's crucial. And the point you picked up on the, the players almost doing the planning, doing reviewing is a whole other great point as well because typically you think of it as coaches, but yeah, ultimately players, can they get that imagination into their head? You know, that sort of picture memory of, you know, right, my objective or, 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 or the team's objective or the individual's objective today is to um, beat players in a 1v1, say, for example. Okay, well, what ways can I beat a player 1v1? How can I imagine in my head, you know, what I'm going to do before, during and after that movement has happened? Um, and if you can get those pictures prior to actually starting, well, actually, when you go into the actual practice, it's, well, when I thought about it before, I thought that I was going to do this. This hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened? Um, and it allows me to sort of then reflect and, and go forwards. But, um, yeah. I, I think just one, just one key point for me is, again, you know, obviously, I, I wouldn't even just say it's foundation. I would just say it's, it could be YDP or PDP as well. Having that football constantly rolling is the key factor for me. So for us as coaches to then start a session by constantly for the next five or 10 minutes talking about the session and what we would like to happen, we've just wasted 10 minutes of their playing time. Yeah. And like you said, the focus is going to be off after the first minute or two. If you're lucky, it could be even shorter than that. So you've lost their time. And it's almost like the trust between yourself and the players, it tends to go because they're going to come to each training session and think, oh, here we go again, next 10 minutes, we've lost that 10 minutes, we're not going to train, we're going to miss out on game time. And again, going by my experience in the foundation phase, all the little ones really and truly that I work with want to do, is just kick the ball. Yeah. They want to kick the ball as much as possible. And the more time you give them to kick the ball is the more trust they give to you regarding things that you would like to point out to them during the session. They will listen more. Okay, coach, I've got that, no problem. And then even then, it's more of a case of I can answer a question why do you think that happened? When should you do that? Then they're going to, like you said, they just want to go and show you. And just for me personally, coming from South East London, the way I grew up, it was about expressing yourself. And no one wants to hear the coach constantly yapping, yapping on. So I know that I didn't like it as a kid, and I never experienced that, but I saw other coaches who did that. All I got to do was express. I wanted to express with the ball. Could I run with the ball? Could I tackle? Could I shoot? Could I score? That's what they want to do. So yes. try and get your, your inner kid self into the same environment as the kids that you're working with. That way you can understand and relate more instead of constantly talking. So having that ball constantly rolling, you get different brilliant outcomes from these kids when it comes to feedback in the session. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and do you know what's funny as well? Is that as coaches, when we're planning, we plan about the session actually physically happening. But then actually we kill ourselves because like you said, you know, if we're typically talking for too long or, you know, we're constantly stopping the session and actually we're not doing what we're planning. And I know typically as coaches, the session doesn't always come out as we intended and that's fine. But yeah, how, you know, it's contradictory because like I said, how often, and it's, again, even probably just through my time at work in the FA and over like the last five years, I didn't ever realise about, the whole thing of, you know, I need to keep this ball moving. Like you said, it's, it's so obvious to see now when you think about yeah. it because ultimately you're there to play football, but yeah. you might don't plan that. You know, you plan the intricate parts of the session and what the session may look like, but people forget about, you know, how long is this ball actually rolling for? How long are players actually getting to interact on the ball? So, yeah, no, really, really cru cru crucial point there. But, um, but yeah, no, I think it's a really interesting topic. I think the whole planning, doing, review thing, I think it's coming into the game a lot more now. Um, and I do think that certain environments really push emphasis onto, you know, the importance behind that. And I think ultimately, as we've kind of picked up on some of the points, you know, yes, it's for the players, but also take a bit of pride in our, ourselves as well. Of, Absolutely. Know, making sure that we go through these stages so that it's effective for these players. But um but no, it's a fantastic discussion. And um, yeah, when people are watching and listening to this, make sure you put your comments in the uh, box below and let us know your thoughts around how much time you spend planning, doing, reviewing, um, and have you found it effective for your players? And if you're maybe a player, how do you find the effectiveness from the coach when they're doing their um, planning, doing, reviewing sections? And is that evident within the session? But yeah, no, fantastic discussion. Um, and yeah, keen to know people's thoughts.
So for this next part of the show, we've got the five aside challenge. And what I do is the coach who's with me on the week, I set them a five aside challenge around a certain topic or a certain outcome within those five aside players. So this week's five aside challenge is a five aside of players that have won elite title. So over to you, your five aside team of players that have won elite title. Oh, I have my players. I was starting goal would be Edwin van der Sar. Nice. Uh, I would have Roy Keane in the team, just to have that centre-back midfield kind of general role to bring the ball out and so on. Um, I would have, might be surprising to some people, Jason Park, uh, former Manchester United player, fantastic selfless player, technically gifted as well, just all about the team for me personally. I would have the master, the magician, Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp was one of my one of my favourite players ever. And like I said, another technically gifted player, a leader, but a quiet leader at the same time. And I think finishing off that five-a-side team would have to be the phenomenal R9, the original Ronaldo. Don't get me wrong, I love Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi, but for me, that's my that's my hero. That's, that's always been, been my guy. So that would be my five-a-side team. Nice. And that five-a-side team would consist of, like I said, serious leaders, guys that are, winners and not just winners in the aggressive way but also the intellectual way so it was key to have a mixture of of quiet and vocal leaders or and technically gifted players with a minimum mentality yeah no it's nice this is a quality five side team and, and it's true do you know what so many people obviously think about cr7 nowadays and don't be wrong obviously yeah you know no words to describe how phenomenal he is but yeah so many people forget about um r9 and you know he's it's almost a disrespect because of just how, yeah. you know, of a legacy he's had within the game and, and how he's inspired so many players. But it, it's interesting. And the reason why I wanted to do um, this topic this week of, you know, players that have won a league title. Now, typically I'll give these, or the, the players that may be picked a, a label of being winners. But what okay. I want to really pick up on is what is a winner? Because as you've kind of alluded to there, all those players have different key skills and traits um, and don't get me wrong, there's been some players along the years where they've probably been in the squad, you know, don't have no real strengths and qualities that are clear to see, but still are winners. Um, and it's interesting the point you make about Jason Park, because listen, I, I agree with you. I think absolute phenomenal player. And throughout all the interviews and discussions of players that have spoken about him, they have the exact same thing to say. But when you look at him, you wouldn't necessarily say, do you know what? Winner there. And I think as a coach, it's us trying to find the intricate details of these individuals. What were some of the makeups of these players? And, and yeah, what would you say a winner is to you almost? I think it's having, when I, when I picked that team, it was all about the, the growth mindset. Yeah. And when I say growth, I'm looking at Van der Sar, starting with Van der Sar. And not many people realise he was an outfield player before he became a goalkeeper. Again, he comes from that Dutch background of total football. So he's had that education of total football and what each position represents. And that's something that I've always followed when it comes to the Dutch philosophy, whether it's Cruyff, uh, Van Gaal or uh, Rennie Mullenstein, who was at Manchester United as well. There's always that addiction to being educated within the field and having that mindset to constantly be educating yourself. And then when we look at Roy Keane, I think Roy Keane was one of those underdog players that came from the league in, in, in Ireland, but had something different about him. And that constant winning mentality and that leadership package where he wasn't known as being the most fanciable or, you know, technically beautiful player, but he did things a simple way which allowed his team to be able to have a better chance of winning. And not just winning the sense where it's like each game, there was always a bigger picture. Anytime I used to listen to Roy Keane after in interviews, it's all about the, the, the bigger picture, not just the next game and the next game and the next game. How can we win and why? And then when we look at the likes of Dennis Burkham, again, not someone who was massively vocal, but at the same time, he was a winner. He, or I go back to the game, I think it was 2002, where it was against Newcastle and St. James Park where he scored that, that goal, as you can call it. And even now, I've watched that clip probably a million times plus, and I still couldn't even recreate that goal in slow motion. 
So that there is being brave and being a leader to be able to try something like that in such an important game where they didn't have the, um, I, don't, I don't know, they didn't have their full squad at that time and he stepped up. So that's a big thing for me. And regarding R9, as phenomenal as, as he was, yes, it was beautiful to see on the pitch, but this man came back for some serious injuries. If you look at, there's a picture that I've seen on over the internet where he's got the scars for his knee surgery and so on. And these were the days where, you know, surgery wasn't as advanced as it is today. So to be able to play in that era on those type of pitches against those physically and quite brutal players that he played against, especially that season he had in La Liga where they were chopping and diving in and, you know, to come through that and still be able to have a smile on his face and be that person that could lead from the front was is fantastic for me. So that's that's my my team in general and why I picked that team. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And, and, and even with all those points you made about those players, there's one common theme, the mentality of those players and the mentality in which they all have. And it's interesting because although I say typically it's all about the mentality of those different players, but each player has a different slightly type of mentality. How, how yeah. important is it easy to have within a team? Because... What frustrates me sometimes about academies, right, is, and obviously this is more so technical, I suppose, but academies kind of go, well, when we're bringing or producing players through, this is player A, and player A is a first-team player for our club, and this is what we want the player to look like, all of our players that come through. But, as you just kind of alluded to there, it's so important to have different mentalities and different strengths and different characteristics. For you, do you believe that it's important to have different types of characters, different mentalities, different ways of thinking, or, you know, is there a problem if you do have players or, or, or teams that have similar or the same mindsets? I think you need a mixture of both. And that mixture of both has got to come from the top down to the level of the, the, the players. So whether that's the going from the physio to the kit man or kit woman or the dinner lady or the general manager, and the coach and the players, you have to have a similar mindset on that level. But then when you actually put those things into execution onto the pitch, I think you need a good variety of characteristics from each player, which, because if you have just one set mind, you're not really able to deal with different scenarios on the field. And even when you go look into coaching as well, if you don't have a plan B or C, then really and truly, what is your main aim? Are, are you an actual coach or is this just something that you're boosting your ego? So for me personally, if I'm working with a bunch of coaches and my way is my way, if I can't open the door to appreciate other people's characteristics, whether it's their leadership qualities or their technical ability or even their silence, then I'm not growing as a person and my team won't grow. So for me, it's, you, you've got to have a bit of both when it comes to either similar or different type of characteristics for me. Yeah, no, it's a great point because I suppose, you know, when we talk about individuals, I think it's really important for individuals to have different types of ways of doing things. But ultimately, like you said, if you're in a team, you know, you all need to be striving towards a sort of similar goal or same outcomes or same objectives. So yeah. where it comes down to the individual's craft or the individual's skill is their ability, like you said, to almost distribute their different ways of thinking and their experiences um, in these different situations and scenarios, but understanding that they're doing it as a collective, almost. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah, which I think absolutely. is... Absolutely. Um, and then, as well, just kind of picking up on, you know, you talk about people who typically win things as well, so obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the task was people who won a league title. And obviously mentioned with R9 the sort of challenges in which he had in terms of you know the setbacks of injuries and stuff once you say for example are labeled as a winner typically how easy or hard do you think it is to then respond or maintain that level of being a winner because it's very people quick to brand people individuals or teams as winners and especially like say for example in a lot of grassroots settings when a team may say for example win a league then they go, well, we're a team of winners. But, you know, have they sort of accredited that achievement yet? Or, you know, does it even have to reflect a title or an award? Or could that be, again, as you just kind of mentioned, the, the mentality of players, that they could have a winning mentality almost? 
or winning? I I think having a winning mentality and what it looks like can come in different different ages. Yeah. So when I look at say in the foundation phase, for me personally, it's not about how many cups or titles you win. It's are you growing? Are you developing as 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 a player? Now that's having that winning mentality. Have I gone from level A to level C in the time that is being given to me, or even ahead of time, or have I enjoyed that growth from A to C, if if that makes sense? And as you get older, I think your mentality becomes more about winning cups and so on into the next stage, whether it's, you know, the YDP phase, you know, you're still growing. Can I develop from A to C and enjoying that? But now can you add D, which is, you know, a junior cup final or, or something or, uh, you know, a, a, a league and, and so on that gives that extra boost to prepare you for the eventual goal, which seems to be in elite football, male and female. Can I win the league? Can I win the cup competitions? Can we win the cup competitions in Europe? And again, Hence why I say from foundation going through to, you know, first team football, the, the structure of the winning mentality changes. But it's about can you enjoy and learn through each, cha- uh, through each stage and then get to the final stage? Because if you stumble in between and your mentality either goes backwards or it goes too far ahead, you kind of can rock the boat on your own personal development. So for me, that winning mentality is key, but it all depends on what, part of your journey that you're currently in but even as a coach as well for me the, the, the mentality like you like we said earlier on working as a coach you just want to go plan and go and do do you're not really thinking about the reviewing and so on but once you go through certain courses and surround yourself by a different mindset of people your winning mentality is can i review my sessions a lot more better if i review my sessions a lot more better then i'm personally winning because i'm going to be developing better designs for the players to give them a better chance of developing themselves. And that is the ultimate goal. So the winning mentality just changes from, for me, from foundation, through the YDP, through the PDP and, and first team. So it should be there, but what is the structure through each phase of your football journey? Yeah, nice. And then key thing you picked up on there about the journey, what stage you're at your journey, because, you know, when I typically think of some of the phases you mentioned as well, like, you know, R9, so he had a lot of injuries, which, you know, mm-hmm sported parts of his career. Edwin van der Sar, he came from Fulham. So, you know, until you enter Man United and started absolutely dominating every sort of award and, and title that he won. But actually, and, and I talk about this a lot, the importance of failing. And, you know, often we think of failure as a negative word, but actually, you know, it's that whole sort of, um, you know, abbreviation of what failing actually means, an opportunity to learn. And, you know, it's interesting because although players, like even some of the ones you mentioned, obviously have won things, if they win it at an early stage in their career, somebody like, say, for example, typically you think of now Mbappe, you know, he's won, you know, essentially league titles in France, but he's lost in the Champions League final. So, you know, it's then, therefore, well, even if he had won it, you know, would it make him necessarily a winner? Well, he's won the World Cup. So, yeah. It, Things where I think that as well to become a winner um, or be labelled as a winner, it is important to experience failure and also understand that person or that individual's journey because ultimately they may win things, but the journey for them to actually get to there may have been constant failure, constant near moments, but it hasn't quite happened, whether it be through injury, whether it be through losing a game, whether it be through not being selected, whether it being through coaches having different um, objectives or outcomes. I mean, typically as well, you know, as a coach, if we always, if we went into manage a team, I think, yes, we'd want to win things, but typically like us two, where we have growth mindsets, we're probably thinking, well, let's develop players. But ultimately, as we know, managers in, in the day and age that we're in, they don't have time to do that. So, there's all these external factors, which I think definitely do go into producing winners. But I think that, yeah, failing is such an important stage. Um, and even like you mentioned before about getting things wrong as coaches, it's exactly the same. You know, t- technically we're failing as a coach, maybe at a session which we wanted to bring a certain outcome within, but haven't been able to for whatever reason. So I, I, I fully agree. I mean, you know, when you just mentioned Mbappe, I just thought of something where... I remember when England won the under-20 World Cup uh, recently. Now, 
I'm not saying that England wouldn't have won it if you know Mbappe wasn't in the France squad, but the French French Football Federation did something which I quite valued. They took him out of those squads to potentially win that that cup, which is a very important cup. But it was all about his journey. It was about where's the best place for him currently at that time, which they did. They took him and put him into the the the, the men's national team, which eventually later on paid off paid off. And he won the World Cup. Now, some players will view it as, well, he could have won the under-20s if he was there, but we, we would never know. But I think it's having that correct mindset to go, OK, that tournament is really important, but what is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is, can we produce the right players for our national team later on, which they've proven that he won eventually. And then I think that was a massive, you know, a massive plug for, for them. And then when you look at, you know, like I said, I've got Roy Keane in my, my team. He didn't actually play in the Champions League final. But for me personally, without him in that semi-final, if I remember, against Juventus in Turin, where he got that booking earlier on in the game, but he still was the one that leaped up in the, in, from the corner to score that first goal, which then led to York and Cole developing their partnership. Now, without him scoring that goal and taking that responsibility as captain, the rest of the team wouldn't have won. As, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a Man United fan. So for him producing that leadership quality, that alone just says he's a winner for, throughout for me. It's not about him. He didn't cry about it. He may have had his personal feelings, but it was about, okay, my journey from younger to now has not been about me just getting to this particular final. You know, he's won the premiership before and so on and so on, but it was all about the team. We're going to win as a team. Yes, we're going to go to the final. I'm not playing, but I've also played my part. And that's a winning mentality for me. So even when you look at R9, if memory correct, I mean, people, please correct me, but I don't think he won the Champions League. Yeah. And the seasons where he left to go to a different club, that he just missed out the following season, if, if, if I remember correctly. So, but that doesn't stop him being a phenomenal player. That stop, doesn't stop him from being a winner. I mean, the man went and won two World Cups. You know, yes, in 94, he didn't play, but he was in the squad. And he was in the squad surrounded by uh, winning people with winning mentality. So he then took that winning mentality with him into 98, which, OK, they lost the final. But then to come back after 98, losing that final the way they, they did, to go in 2002 and just steamroll everyone through there. You know, I mean, his haircut was a bit dodgy at the time, but... You know, we can move on from that one. But that's winning mentality for me. And with, with those three scenarios that I've given you, they wouldn't have happened unless their journey as players from foundation to youth development to PDP wasn't with the correct structure. So for me, that's where the key journey is. It's great to have a winning mentality, but I think it can't be the same for each age group and each age journey. So having the structure for a foundation, then YDP and PDP, wherever those goals are in each club, it's important because it eventually helps those players, like I said, those three players, to have that winning mentality, what's important. Yeah, no, they're three fantastic examples and, and just listening to them as well, it does, it makes you think of two things. Number one, you know, Mbappe could have turned around and said, you know, I want to win this under-20 competition, but he didn't. And I think what's good there as well is obviously the mentality of the players as individuals but ultimately, somewhere along that pathway, coaches have probably paid an impact on the decision making of, you know, absolutely, you're going to be in this team, you're not going to be in this team, or just in terms of molding. Again, similar to what we talk about as coaches having growth mindsets, players having growth mindsets. You know, you're at the early stage of your career, you've got the whole career ahead of you. Actually, this is going to be more impactful on your development as an individual and also the impact that you will have on the team as well. So I think, yeah, great, great examples because it, it does, it brings out the mentality of the players, but then also as well, it kind of reflects and highlights the importance on the mentality of the coach in understanding, like you said, the different journeys in which these players are at and which stages. I, I think it's, it's, it's key. And, you know, it's not an easy job, David, as you very well know. And I think a big challenge that we as coaches face is getting the players to understand the bigger picture. And then not just them, because they're young people. So whether a little boy, little girl, you know, it's, you're, you're there to help them grow as a person as well. But the big challenge for me is when you work with parents. 
And when you look at today's era of football, what I've seen, and again, whether it's on TV, whether it's on the internet or personal experiences, the parents, some parents' idea is we want to win this cup now. I, you know, I want my son or daughter to win this. And it's a challenge as a coach to get the parents to follow the journey that's right for their child. And, you know, playing in the under seven, eight, nines, 10 game and winning that game is not the be one end all. What's important is if your son or daughter has a personal individual plan that they're working to, to enhance their strengths and things that they're not so strong on, we should look out for those factors. So when we're reviewing games uh, with their child, go through those points. Don't go through the points of, oh, your team lost or you should have scored this. It's, it's not about that because if you can get the parents to see that bigger picture and help them to see the bigger picture, then it takes the pressure off the player, the, the little boy, little girl, when they're at home and watching the games with their parents. Because I remember personal experience with, with my parents. It was a case of, I didn't want my parents at the game because I, I, I knew how they were. And as much as I love my parents, it wasn't best for me having them there because I knew I wouldn't play too well. Whereas today, kids don't have really that voice to say, I don't want you there because the parents seem to be so involved with watching what's going on to the left of them and to the right of them of what their friends are doing with their kids. Okay, we're going to go and get this coach. We're going to go and get that. We're going to, do you know, so... It's important for the clubs to have that close and personal relationship with the families to understand the family situation and get them to come on board with what picture we see as coaches and as a club. And then they'll be able to go, OK, right, this is the best way to support my son or my, my daughter. So the challenge with the players is big, don't get me wrong, but if we can get the parents on the side, then it's a lot more clearer because I'm sure Mbappe's parents would have been thinking, well, my son could have won this, but... If they've had that correct journey, which it looks like they have, they understand, yeah, but my son's being pushed up to the men's first team where it's a very good squad and potentially we can win this. And then they went into the Euro final. Then two years later on, they went into the World Cup final and they won it. So getting the parents on board to see the bigger picture is an essential factor for me, which helps the kids coming forward. Yeah, no, key point, because as well, typically we'll get labelled or players will get labelled as winners or, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe it's a bit of a strong word from a parent's perspective, but, you know, they'll get labelled as non-winners. And that's typically from a parent's point of view because the yeah. parents want them to be winners. In, in, mm -hmm. in. So, yeah, that's a fantastic point. But, um, but no, listen, fantastic five-side team. I think, yeah, some, some really key messages there of, you know, what helps to potentially get that sort of winning mindset or become a winner or, you know, so mentalities, it's those leadership skills um, and it's like you said, the whole bigger picture of not only just the player but the impact of the coach and the parents as well so I think yeah, key, key and crucial points there but no, again, as I always say, people who are listening and watching put in the comments below your thoughts around that five-a-side team and see if there's a five-a-side team that you potentially could match up against that um, and also um, some of the key things which you think goes into people who go on to win titles or leagues um, or potentially individual awards as well um, and has if you're a player has that mentality really helped you to mould into um, in inverted commas again a winner almost but yeah no fantastic five side team and yeah let us know your thoughts This week on the Daily Coaching Football Show, I'm absolutely delighted to announce a very, very, very special guest, okay? This professional player has played for multiple teams across Europe, including England and Belgium, and he's currently playing at Watford and has played over 100 games, as well as also representing internationally for the Belgium national side. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to have with me today, Christian Cabasele. What was the first ever match or um, you went either went to or saw on TV. Can you remember that? Uh, yes, I remember. By uh, my first game was uh, was at uh, actually uh, I didn't know at that time that I would play for for them, but it was at uh, Genk in Belgium. Uh, so I was uh, like uh, yeah, maybe ten years old, something like this, and it was a Champions League uh, game uh, against Real Madrid. So um, this was my first experience in a in a football stadium and. Uh, and yeah, the, the the story tells me after that uh, he, I I played uh, I played for for the team uh, that I saw first in life. So 
yeah, it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice story. How did the fence come about for you? Because over in England, there it's sort of phasing out now. But typically, so I'm quite tall, and I don't, I don't think I even really had a choice. I think someone just said to me, "Look, you're tall, you're big, you go as, as defence." And that was kind of how a lot of academies picked centre backs up or defenders up. There's like, "You're big physically, so we can work on certain things around you." How, how did it kind of develop for yourself? Uh, but for me, I, it started uh, as a striker first of all. Uh, well, I was I was striker striker until my my 23s actually. So uh, I did a very late change of position. Uh, so yeah, uh, as you said, uh, nobody wants to be defender in the beginning. <laughs> wants to be uh, me. I wanted to be like Thierry Henry uh, because I was a big fan of Arsenal. Uh, but you want to be like Ronaldo. You want to be like Messi. You don't want to be uh, like like Rio Ferdinand. Uh, you don't want to be like uh, Nemanja Vidic, for example, or. or or, or Sergio Ramos, you just want to score goals and um, and be part of of the attack and just playing with the ball. So uh, so yeah, me, I was a striker. I wanted to be a striker, and at some point of my career, uh, when I was in Open, uh, we were missing one defender, and uh, the, the 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 championship uh, start uh, like uh, the week after, and the manager one day come uh, and one day the manager come to me and said, "Listen, we we don't have time to." To, to buy something someone so uh, I will try to to put you in defense because as you said you are tall you are fast you are good in the air um, so uh, I will see and um, I started to, to play like 30 minutes in a friendly game and uh, and after he put me for the first game of the season and we won for for nil the, that game and uh, that's how my my journey as a defender starts at the age of uh, of 20 22 years old and uh, and seven years, uh, seven years later, I'm, uh, I played more than uh, 100 games for for an English uh, an English team. So it's quite uh, it's quite amazing. How did that sort of transpire into when you officially made your your debut as a pro? Yeah, it was uh, it was when I was 17. So uh, it was in uh, in a pen. I joined I joined this team uh, when I was uh, 14 years old. Uh, so it was a team uh, second league in Belgium at that time. Uh, before that, I was in a, like a village, uh, like a small club uh, near near for my home, uh, just to enjoy with my friends. Um, and the funny thing is that when I tried decide to move to uh, to open, it was uh, thirty five minutes from home, and uh, I wanted to be with my friends as well. So I asked the club to to pick up two of my friends to to come with me, and uh, they they agree with that. So uh, I was able to to stay with my friends because I was. Uh, for me, the, the 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 friends relationship was really important, uh, even at that time, and uh, and yeah, so I, uh, I I I went there. I played first with the on on the on the fifteen after on the sixteen, and uh, arrived the the moment um, when uh, when uh, I was uh, uh, I this wanted by uh, another club by uh, Standard de Liège in uh, in first division in Belgium. So uh, at that moment, Open decided to to put me in the first team at uh, when I was supposed to play with uh, under seventeen. So I was uh, I was sixteen years old when I when I joined the the the, the, the first team, and uh, I had to wait a couple of months to to play my first game at uh, at the age of uh, seventeen years old, uh, twenty minutes. Uh, uh, of of my uh, of for for my debut and uh, and yeah I was I was remember, I was thinking about the game that I watch in in Genk I, I was saying yes I went to see some players in the stadium and now I'm 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 the player on on, on the pitch so so yeah the 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 kid that I was at that time was uh, more uh, more than happy is there any sort of centre backs which have retired um, throughout the game which you kind of look back on and think Do you know what I would have loved to have played with that player, um, having them alongside me. Uh, yes, I would say uh, we are we are Ferdinand um, because he, he had everything for uh, that uh, a top centre backs uh, had, have to do have to have. Uh, so uh, yeah, he won trophies. He was good in the air. He was good on the ball. So uh, yeah, he was so so dominant and so uh, charismatic. And uh, yeah, I would love to to play with him. Was there any other sports which you thought to yourself, do you know what? 
I'm, I'm pretty good at this and do you know what I, I could potentially go quite far in this or, or was it just purely football I wasn't that kid <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> no me it was it was only football uh, yeah I, I tried once to do uh, judo okay. some judo but uh, after the first session I went to my mother and I asked her uh, why should I hurt somebody who didn't do anything to me so um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was uh, maybe too pacific for for doing uh, judo. So, no, me it was uh, it was only football, and um, it's funny because I can see right now with uh, with my son as well. He's five, and uh, we bought him like some basketball, uh, some uh, some tennis uh, racket, and uh, he always finished with uh, with the foot uh, with the football. So, uh, so yeah, it's football uh, football as well for him uh, every time. So. Only football at home. Who would you pick within your five-a-side team out of all the players that you played with throughout your career? Uh, I think it will be a, a, almost a full uh, Belgium player, full, Bel- full Belgium team, because uh, yeah, uh, I had the chance to be in the national team with uh, with the golden ge- generation in Belgium. So in goal, it will be uh, Thibaut Courtois. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, he was uh, he was incredible when he when he started and during the, the, the this time at Chelsea uh, as well in Atletico he won almost all the all the trophies possible. Uh, I will pick uh, Vincent Company, uh, the leader, the the, the 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 one of the best defender in the in the Premier League and uh, and yeah, it's top uh, top defender. Um, after I will pick uh, Eden Hazard. Uh, because he's simply uh, simply a genius. Uh, next to him, Kevin De Bruyne, uh, as well, like Hazard, uh, what he's doing and the things that he can see during the game, it's it's, it's um, unbelievable. And uh, as, as a striker, I will pick uh, Romelu Lukaku because uh, I think he was really, really uh, underestimated in England. Yeah. Uh, um, and he's, uh, I, I never, I never understand that uh, because he was he's so, so powerful. He's quick uh, in front of the goal. He, he's, he's a killer, and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's proved now we are at at Inter that he's uh, one of the best strikers, uh, probably top five striker in Europe right now. So, so yeah, I think he's not he's not about uh, five aside. Has there been a sort of standout moment in terms of you've looked back and gone, do you know what? Like I'm so proud of myself in achieving that. The, the the best moment of my career so far was the the, the Euro 2016. Um, yes, 2016 with Belgium. So uh, before that, I, I I never get a call uh, for the national team, and uh, there were a lot of injuries. And uh, finally, I made I made the final final squad to go in the Euro 2016, and. Uh, it was it was unbelievable because I, I changed position only uh, three seasons before that one, and uh, being able to 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 be in the national team uh, in uh, so so quickly it it was it was incredible and yeah the the the, the stadium was full we played uh, against uh, top players so for me it was I think it was as well the the beginning of something for me because. Uh, after the Euro, I signed for for Watford, and uh, and now I I played more 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 than 100 games for them. So, so yeah, it was uh, really the the, the 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 best moment of my career. So for the next part, we've got Tweet of the Week. And within Tweet of the Week, what I do is I have a little look through Twitter. I find a tweet which I'm quite engaged with, I find interesting. Um, and what we do is we discuss the positives, negatives, um, and just, again, overall have a bit of a discussion around our thoughts and opinions on that tweet. So in this week's Tweet of the Week, we have, what is your area of expertise in coaching? Um, so first of all, what do you think expertise within coaching actually is? Because... People typically think of themselves maybe as an expert in something, but what would you classify as an expert? I always tend to classify an expert as being someone who has a good solid base of understanding of what they're trying to deliver and or produce with the possibility of constant growth. Because for me, being an expert in something doesn't mean that there's just a start and a finish. There's always a start. There's an in-between. 
And then there's a constant road where it just keeps on going. So for me, it's about having that strong base of what you're passionate about and having that growth mindset to go, right, I want to continue on this road and become better. So that's for me, that's a version of, of being an, an expert. Nice. And, and do you think that um, it comes from internally or externally that the person's reflected on as an expert? Mm, it's, it's, that's a tricky one because when we look at today and some of the coaches where you've got examples of being, I think, like a throwing coach and so on, I cannot actually remember or visualise someone going, OK, I'm going to be a throwing expert and, and so on. So I think it's something that's come externally but there's also an internal part that says, this is a starting point. And then for me as a person, it's down to you to then improve on that passion that you've got a good base from. So I think it's a mixture of both internally and externally. Again, for, that's how I see it when it comes to set pieces or throw-ins and so on. Like I said, there's no starting and finish. There's a starting base. And then externally, it's just that road that continues. The more passion you have for it, the more you become a stronger expert. 100%. I think, yeah, it comes, it comes with experience. And sometimes we, we don't necessarily set out on the, the pathway and think, right, I'm going to go up to expertise level of that um, certain scenario situation. But it's something that kind of happens based on our understanding, our knowledge, like you said, that, that, that different stages of the um, pathway, really, along that journey. Um, and... Obviously, like you mentioned there, so obviously, you know, Liverpool had the throwing coach um, and obviously Wimbledon now got a set piece coach. Um, and, you know, probably, I mean, typically as well, if, let's be honest, specialism coaching has been around for years and years and years because typically a goalkeeper, a goalkeeping yep. coach, coach. And sometimes we almost forget about that because of the more trendy types of coaches like the, the, the throwing and the um, set piece one. But for you, if you wanted to, say, for example, find an area of coaching where you thought, you know, not necessarily that you go and set out to become an expert within, but you wanted to commit more to within that area. How would you even go about that? Because um, the, the FA used to have those courses where it was like developing defenders, the midfield course and the striker course. And I remember from my time as playing, I always was a defender. So the defending one always interested me because I had a close relationship and affinity with that uh, position. But obviously they scrapped those courses now. So for myself, it's like, well how can I actually go about becoming an expert or a specialist within a certain area? Because when we coach football, we're almost coaching everything, obviously not at the same time, but, you know, throughout a season or throughout a curriculum. So, yeah, what, what's, what's your thoughts around that? I would say it's probably similar to how I've always been, even when it comes to planning the session and even when I was in grassroots. Again, I'm an ex-defender myself too, so... I spent a lot of time as a youngster watching Serie A. And the reason why I watched that, because I've always branded Italian football as very defensive, not in a negative way. It's a beautiful art for me. So again, having that passion there, it's kicked me off to realise a lot of my sessions, I feel personally, I'm very good at getting that either 1v1 one, one one or under loads, 2v1s and so on. I have a sheer passion for it. So I think it's essential to have that starting point of being passionate about something and trusting your own knowledge and becoming a, an expert, you know, because as you said, the FA used to have certain courses where they may not be there anymore, but football is constantly evolving. So for you to become an expert in something, like I said, you have to have that starting point, you have to have the passion and you have to have the growth mindset that says, I'm going to continue to grow. And the only way you can grow is talking to your fellow peers. And don't get me wrong, the FA courses, whether it's the English FA, Welsh or the Irish or whatever FA it is, there's always good courses available. But I think as an individual, you learn a lot more as well amongst your peers. So if I feel something is good or it could be stronger and I can't visually see it yet, I will always talk to people that, I've learned from. And these are people that it doesn't matter what qualifications they have. They could have a level one, they could have a, a, a pro license, or they could be grassroots coaches. It's about being in the environment and having the right people to go, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Getting that feedback back from them. 
which eventually, okay, I can accumulate it into one idea, grabbing their experiences, and then go to the next stage of being, becoming an expert. So if I wanted to work on, like I said, becoming a better one-to-one, one-v-one uh, one coach as defensive side, I will talk to people that I've learned from because I find that a lot of coaches tend to rely on the internet. They tend to rely on going on a certain course and thinking once they've qualified from that course, they're a qualified coach. They're, 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 they're superb. Now, don't get me wrong. You learn a lot from these courses, but you don't become a Pep or a Jose because number one, you're not them. And number two, that shouldn't be your main aim on those courses. So I've always found anything that I like to believe I'm, I'm strong at, I always leave room for people to give me feedback. And David, I'll be honest with you, when people give me feedback, there's some elements that I may not agree with, but there's also lots of elements that I do agree with. So to have that mentality to realise whether I agree with someone or not, I should still give it a try. And if I'm going to give it a try, it's only going to enhance my expertise in the actual field that I want to get stronger at. So that that's my, my view on that one. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Two points picked up on there. So first of all, about the courses, I, I totally agree with you. I Honestly, it might sound like a strong word. I hate courses. I hate qualifications. Okay. I think that for me, qualifications are job indicators and not ability indicators. There's been so many coaches that, you know, have passed X amount of courses and, you know, they, they, they're sort of they have a hat on of that they're this kind of coach or that they're that level of coach. When for me, when I've gone out to mentor coaches, there's been coaches who haven't even got their qualifications. And for me, they're much more um, adaptable and um, sort of a lot more comfortable within certain elements of coaching than say, for example, some of these courses themselves. So, and it's interesting because when I've done my studies, um, I found a model called the 70 20 10 model. And from that, it says that basically it was all around CPD and how um, learners can actually be effective from CPD opportunities. And they said that basically, when I first went into courses, I always thought, you know, I'm going to pick up so much information from these tutors, and that's going to be where I learn my information. 10% of the learning that learners achieve on a course or a CPD is from the tutor, 20% is through conversations with other learners. And 70% is when we actually do the stuff within our own environments. So ultimately, like you just kind of said there, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give us the tools or the um, arsenal for what we're actually going to go out there and doing. Um, and I think the point you picked up on as well about sort of, like you said, sometimes when people you know, might give you feedback or might give you an opinion, ultimately, that's all it is. You know, again, just because they may be, say, for example, a higher qualification or they may have been more experienced in the years. Yes, we can take on this feedback. But ultimately, I think what's important as well is in being an expert or a specialist within a certain area is being confident and knowing what you're talking about. So ultimately, Absolutely. You know, if you feedback and you're well within your entitlement to say, do you know what? I don't agree with it. But what I always say to players and coaches is just explain why. You know, if you can explain why you don't agree with it, I don't say problem solved, but, you know, that's fine. Because ultimately yeah. what you've done is you've given a reasoning behind why you're doing a certain thing in the way you are or why you have a certain way of thinking. Um, and I think that that's quite important as well, confidence. And it's not arrogance, but confidence in what you believe in and why you're doing it. And I think sometimes that as well, because I actually interviewed the local throwing coach. And I'll be honest with you, my mind was blown like some of the stats he's coming out with around sort of certain like how many minutes um a, a game is spent within throw-ins how many times a throw-in happens the certain yards distances the the, the follow-on effects from a throw-in now someone could turn around to him and say well you know what matters is getting the ball in the back of the net okay but the stats and facts which he had to back that up you can't argue with it because not at all they understand it and they know it and and you know, whether it's right or wrong, I mean, I don't know many people that actually go into researching that and find out if it's true, but you almost take it to face value. You know, you know what? This person knows what they're talking about. So would you say that confidence and understanding is a huge part of being an expert or a specialist in a certain area? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think a lot of it has gone from, the reason why I would say that is a lot of it's from my own learning. And like I said, making that transition from grassroots community into elite academy football my eyes has been open to so many different aspects of, of the game in general like you said the stats factor I mean when I look at things such as restarts in games 
And again, I'm working obviously the basis from foundation faith. It's constant. It's constant. The amount of restarts you find in that game, when you're actually watching a game, you don't think of it at that time. So working alongside different type of analysts and getting their insight to things and what they see and what they're breaking down, I've taken that information from them and put it into my own knowledge at the same time. And again, it's that thing, having that confidence to understand that there's different factors in within your field, it's going to help you grow. Now, I mentioned a little while earlier on to you about coaches' ego. Sometimes some coaches, they either have the way to go is letter A and nothing else. It doesn't matter who's around them. That, that's going to stop you as a coach being able to become an expert in a field that, that you want to get into, whether that's you know, foundation or YDP or a throwing specialist or set piece uh, specialist. If you want to do something, you have to be open to change and not just change from different people, change within yourself. So for me, having that confidence to allow people in to your environment to say, okay, Sheldon, this is what I think. And as you said, it's an opinion, David. And then someone says, no, Sheldon, but I think of this. It's down to you as an individual. Okay, lovely opinions. How can I merge them as one to become better to the next stage? If you don't have that confidence to allow people in and the confidence to actually release your your stats and your information, then you're not going to really improve as a coach in that area of the game. So for me, having confidence is, is essential because if you show the confidence, then you get that same trust and confidence back from people who are going to be honest with you with their feedback and honest with you when it comes to trying different methods that you're trying to deliver in your session, whether it's set pieces, whether it's throw-ins or restarts, whatever it is. So you've got to have a bit of both, but confidence is, is a key for me. Yeah, 100. And, and I think as well, sometimes when people question you or, you know, go against what you're saying or what you're thinking, actually, I always used to think, oh, it's, they, they think they know better than me, um, which in some cases that people do. But also as well, they're actually trying to pick my brains because they want yeah. to more information so, so in you being able to give a confident or a affirmative answer back as to why how and, and all these things actually you're also informing and helping that individual gain some knowledge and understanding behind it as well because absolutely I, I, the thing that annoys me about coaching sometimes is people from the outside world just see it as well you're only coaching football but I think that coaching in general is a specialism form of teaching. You know, co coaching slash teaching football is so hard. And, you know, people may think it's easy because they played the game or they know or watch football, but it's so hard. The level of detail that goes into it, similar to what we mentioned all the way back at the start in the first discussion, and also now that the game has moved on a little bit where the SA having these courses, FA Level 1, Level 2, um, obviously, but you A for B's, you A for A's, pro licenses. But ultimately, I think when you go into an environment, you're not just a coach. You know, you're a coach, you're a mentor, you have um, a certain area or outcome or objective in which you're trying to work on within a certain player. And all you can ever really do is use these experiences, your peers, like we mentioned, around you. I think that's so important as well, because typically... I think although people may come in with their own ways of doing things, when we go into environments such as, say, for example, like a Fulham, you are often kind of moulded into the way in which Fulham promote their work to be done. However, you bring it out within your own way, and that's what makes you, that's what makes you unique. But it's being done kind of underneath the Fulham umbrella. So I think when we think of expertise, yes, there may be a certain expertise area of a coach, but actually, the expertise is you as an individual and you as a character, almost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just something that I just wanted to add to that as well. When you mentioned about being not just a coach, but you're also a mentor, it's, it's funny because, you know, I work part-time, obviously, at, at Fulham, but I also have a full-time job within a special education needs school. And I'm a TA there and a mentor, and I work on you know, the kids, you know, emotion and speech uh, language as well. So I take elements of that into my coaching work within Fulham and take elements of my coaching work within Fulham into my, my normal day-to-day -day job. So I'm, I'm quite fortunate to have that, like I said, that open mindset to go, right, okay, I'm letting these things in. 
and I'm learning from the people that I'm working with and even the young people that I'm working alongside. So being able to have that confidence and that understanding that my way is not always the right way and being open to that, that, that alone enables you to become a more stronger expert in whatever field you, you, you are in. So it's, it's essential for me. Without other people and the, their experiences, you're not really going to be able to fulfill your ambition. You're not going to be able to fulfill your duties as a coach and so on. So a coach is not just a person, a male or female, standing on the side and saying, go on, go and kick it into the goal. There's different chunks of that human being that you're trying to work with. So, yeah, I fully agree. It's not just about the football. It's about being a better person, a better coach for the people that you're trying to work with on, on all levels. Yeah, 100%. And experience in life, you know, the things that you just mentioned there, the ways in which you're having to communicate with different people that you're coming into contact with. I know it sounds silly, but even things such as, you know, when you go into a shop, and you want to buy something, how do you communicate with that individual? Say, for example, we've all been in shops, so probably, you know, we try and be really friendly. The person in the shop has no time of day for us. But it's, you know, similar within football. When we're trying to teach people how to do things within football, and, you know, as we mentioned before about different uh, learning styles, people just may totally ignore what we're saying. But we know that through our experiences of life and through experiences of communicating with people, it isn't people being rude. It's just that's how certain forms of communication are formed and it's yeah. us as individuals to then use those experiences of okay well even if somebody is quite blank back to us you know how do we either a continue to keep that conversation going or b leave that conversation where it is but on a positive slash non-negative outcome so yeah. you know yeah this these experiences of life and the experiences of communication are so important and I always talk about you know when I strip football away from things there's four key things I always think of um, and as an individual is able to achieve through football but it's relevant to life so that's building relationships and rapports that's becoming a decision maker that's becoming a problem solver and it's becoming a communicator and I think those four things are always things which go through you with as a player or as a coach but ultimately you could almost be an expert within that but there is no yeah. question for it. And the only recognition is when you build these different relationships with players, coaches, peers, parents, and as you go through that journey almost. No, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think I look at two key factors for me personally, the social factor and the psychological factor. And I think with those two key ones, you get stronger outcomes with what you're trying to produce, whether that's, a normal training session, you could be working on transitions or something or another. If you understand people's psychological background and what they think and what they see and how they learn, whether it's by verbally or visual or silence, even more so, and, you know, just your body language, that's huge. Yeah. And being able to, on the social side, to understand the people that you're working with and not just the, the your, your fellow coaches. I'm looking at the players that, you know, you're trying to help guide. You've got players from different cultural backgrounds. You've got different play, uh, players from different learning backgrounds, you know, players that either are at different types of schools, public schools, independent schools, or, you know, or just n normal mainstream schools. So you've got to have those key factors. And as a, a coach, you've got to be able to socially understand what it's like for those players. I, I wouldn't necessarily know what it's like to go to private school but it's down to me to do that research for myself and learn about the players that who are coming to me during the training just to play football and so on. But it's down to me as a coach and to improve myself. Okay, what's the culture like in his or her environment? Whereas I may relate more to certain players who come from an estate or somewhere or, or, or another. Do you know what I mean? But at the same time, the estate mentality may have changed since I was growing up in the state. So I've still got to learn as a coach socially and psychologically. And I think it's a key factor in producing better training sessions, better game plans, better get understanding of what your environment is and just helping you as a coach go forward. So like I said, those are the two key factors that I look into when it comes to whether it's planning, doing or reviewing or any form of coaching. 
Yeah, no, massive, massive. And I think as well, you know, like you mentioned there about the research element of it um, and, you know, our responsibility almost to go out there and find out this information. You know, like we said, you can have experiences within life. You can, you know, have these key uh, skills, qualities and traits. But ultimately, yeah, if there is little gaps, because I, I agree, you know, I come from South London as well. And I think um, it's interesting. When I was talking to a player the other day and we were talking about players who maybe, for example, come from Cambridge, I don't know what it's like to live out in Cambridge. I don't know yeah. what the like, lifestyle is like out there. I don't know how easy slash hard it's been. I can only take things from my own experiences, but actually, you know, and, and I agree, I, I, when I go into schools, I have quite a close affinity with people who have come from similar backgrounds as me um, in terms of, like you said, like maybe rough estates or in inverted commas, broken homes. And, yeah. you know, I want to support them and give them the best possible opportunities. However, you know, my responsibility as a coach is to affect everybody. So I need to, therefore, example, understand that just because somebody may not have come from similar upbringings to myself, that actually they probably have had issues or challenges or, or struggles on the way. So actually I need to understand what it is with them as well. And I think that, like you mentioned about different age groups as well, that's where as well we can almost become experts. I think there's expertise within a few different factors, life and just communication skills, um, age groups, um, and also, I think the third one was um, areas, so like throw-ins, set pieces and things like that, really. So. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, just a, a point you made regarding knowing from someone who's come from a, you know, potentially a rough background or someone who's come from, like you said, Cambridge. I think it's also essential when you're working with these players, regardless of what age, is getting them to all mould together and create a new version of environment. And I don't mean somewhere where you force it upon them. It's also down to the coach. Go, okay, you know, little Jimmy and, 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 and little Stan, you know, they come from different backgrounds or something, you know, then you've got young David coming in or young, put, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, or, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. It's just, you come from there, you come from there, but this is your environment. How can create an environment for you? It doesn't matter that you live in this place or that one lives in that place. You are here as one. Everyone's on the same playing field. And can we bond as one? There's going to be teething, teething challenges, but there's always going to be challenges, teething challenges in your training session, when you're planning it, in your game plans. So I take that same approach when it comes to planning and doing the reviewing when it comes to bringing people together. So, you know, when you look at the four corners, a lot of people look on the physical side and so on. And listen, don't get me wrong. Everyone has their key point in the four corners that they really enjoy. But I suppose going by my experiences and where I feel I'm quite strong at, I always look at the social and the psychological. If you get those two right as much as possible, it's a lot more easier for you to be able to blend people from different areas, different cultures, different ages, you know, different sexes. So that's where I'm coming from when it comes to having that confidence to be able to focus on those elements makes it easier for you as a coach and more enjoyable for the players that you work with. Yeah, no, 100%. And I'm, I'm very much like that as well. I, I definitely sort of prioritise the psychological and social over the technical because the technical is what we always do anyway. So, um, yeah, no, I think it's important point. But no, listen, again, a very interesting conversation um, and it'll be very interesting to find out what the listeners and viewers think around what experts are or what specialists are. Um, and as we kind of alluded to that, you know, is it just in that technical element of the game or can it also be in the psychological and social sides of just being good individuals, characteristics, traits, personalities, um, and yeah, what your experiences are of that as well. So yeah, make sure you let us know in the comments below um, and share your thoughts, but yeah, great discussion. So in this next part of the show, we've got the coaches challenge um, and very similar to tweet of the week, what we do, or sorry, it's very similar to the five aside challenge, what we do challenge but this time with the coaches challenge it's all about a session design or a session plan around a certain outcome or a certain objective okay so this week what i've done is i set the challenge for one part of a session that is suitable for a one-to-one -one session for a low ability player trying to improve on their finishing in the final third so sherlin over to you what have you got for us this one is quite a, a tricky one. When we look at low ability, I try not to label it as that as such. So I, when I look at a session, I put together like a 25 by 25 area 
looking at finishing in the final third, looking at different things using cones, mannequins and footballs and looking at working form on the movement off the ball and also on the ball as well and in areas where having different types of finishes such as inside, outside and laces. Keep it nice and basic. Don't overcomplicate it too, too much and look at looking at finishing from reduced touches as well. So that's really where I would come from, how I would set the, pro, uh, the process up. I would also have small goals to start off with uh, to, and then move it on to bigger goals later on regarding different types of finishes, whether it's from wide areas or central areas. I've also got a couple of progressions there as well. I would add, if I could do, shadow defenders who will block certain passes or defenders who will look for one-to-one -one defending. And I'd also have different areas where the players will work on their social side by having an added teammate who could be a different type of server from wide areas. So I would slowly build it up from the usual one touch off and shoot at goal to seeing how that player is, is growing in confidence. So I wouldn't put the whole progressions on at first, but I'll look to break it down in different stages. Nice, nice, nice session. And, and and on those points as well, how important two things. Number one, how important do you reckon it is for variation? So obviously, as you mentioned there, a range of different types of finishes, because obviously, you know, based on the scenarios and situations that you might find yourself in a game, you're required to do different types of finishes. Um, and also repetition. So yeah, what's your kind of thoughts around variation and repetition within, um, especially a one-to-one -one session where you're going to, or one-to-one -one session where you're going to get a lot more opportunities to do that potentially? I think it's, it's very, very key to have variation and, and repetition. Variation is, is in a game of football. It's for me, it's, it's, in, it's in any sport. And variation is actually in life as well. So nothing's always the same. Things can come from different angles. And that's always been my view about life in general. But when it comes to variation in football, if we're looking at the session you know, that I've just mentioned, we're looking at finishing. There's not one way of finishing. There's obviously, there's a chest and right foot, chest and left foot from different, uh, from the right hand side or the left hand side. Having these, you know, this first touch, you know, two touches, one bounce shot, there's no bounce shot, there's, you know, half volley, full volley, there's different variations within football. So I think the important factor when it comes to variation is not to try and bundle everything all in at once. It's working off of the player's understanding of his or hers ambition to finish. So again, I go back to the social factor, understanding your player, psychologically understanding your player and building that relationship is a key factor before delivering any one-to-one -one session in the first place. There's no point me getting, you know, a young boy, young girl to do one-to-one -one and I don't understand what they want to do. I don't know what their ambition is when they leave from this session. So having that understanding socially, right, okay, this is where, you know, the players come from, the club-wise, what they would like to work on. This is what the club would like them to work on. Then you produce a session for that individual player. And then, like I said before, having that feedback from the player is essential when it comes to different type of variations, when it comes to planning for them. And then when you look at, you know, not just the variation, but repetition, constantly doing it over and over again, some people say that's a waste of time. For me, in a game, you don't necessarily get repetition when it comes to finishing. You know, a ball can come in from the right-hand side. It's not going to be the same type of delivery. But if you can work on the repetition, whether it's from the right or the left or central or different type of surface of passes to be able to receive and shoot first time or, you know, or two touch or more, then you're having that repetition. And when you get in those scenarios in the game, it's more of an easy option for you, more relaxed option. I should say, when it comes to finishing in goal. Yeah, no, 100%. And for me, I always relate uh, repetition to two C words, comfortable and confident. And that's what it is. You know, it's, yes, we, we know as coaches that, look, do you know what? These outcomes will probably might happen once in a game or a even, let's be honest, probably a couple of times over a season. Because like you said, it's just, there's so many different variations and situations and scenarios. However, it's, we're giving the players, and again, it goes back to that psychological Although we're working on a technical, which a lot of one-to-one -one sessions do have that outcome of the technical parts, but ultimately it's a psychological of saying, look, do you know what? If these situations and scenarios do arise, you're comfortable, you're confident, and you can make the decision based on how to finish 
based on some of the things we've actually worked on throughout our time as a, as a one-to-one. And a point you picked up on there, which I think is key with the one-to-one stuff, is that typically you see a lot of one-to-one coaches now, or even if it's a one v one session, where they will have sort of, again, goes back to the plan do review, I suppose, they have a session which they're going to go through, irregardless of the level of player, irregardless of the experience of the player. And, and I agree with you, I use the word liability, but for me, when I talk about liability, it's more so, you know, it could be less experienced, it could be less confident, it could be less comfortable at doing these executions or movements. And in this, we actually know these players, it's very difficult to actually have an effect in these one-to-one sessions. And actually, that's where we should be having more of an effect because ultimately, we're spending so much time with them. So I think the point you raised there about, you know, understanding what the player's intended outcomes are, or importantly, the club, because ultimately when we're working with a team, it's usually our team, when we're working with an individual, they're away from us afterwards. They go back into their own environment, whether they get good training habits or bad training habits. (laughs) It's the option of being able to have what we've taught them to take in with their decision making. Um, and then also as well, I just had to pick up on the point of um, motivation. So obviously when you do sort of like one-to-one sessions or potentially one V one sessions, how do you raise the motivation of a player? Because obviously, let's be honest, when we're when we're young, especially what what age really, we always just want to play football. So it's obviously a lot to bring those outcomes in with a match or a game. But how do you do it in a one-to-one or a one V one session to raise that motivation then? Me personally, whenever I've delivered, you know, a training session or a one-to-one session, I like to, again, I know I've mentioned it before, but I like to socially and psychologically understand that player. So for me to understand what could be best suited for them at that time is getting to know them and what their needs are and what their desires are. Who do they follow? So when I say follow, what's their favourite player and stuff? And again, you know, when we go back to liability, it's a case of, like you said, bringing that confidence to them. So every player has a player or two that they sit down and they watch the YouTube clips and they watch on TV, they, they buy that shirt. That's the player that they seem to be want to try and to, to, to mirror. So that's a good starting point for me. So if you can make references to, you know, how that player was on their journey, if you do your own research as a coach, and like I said, I've used a tablet sometimes for my training sessions, and I would have like clips of, let's put together a, a Marcus Rashford and the way he cuts in on his right foot from the left. And that's how, you know, the, the young boy or girl wants to play. So I would have clips on that, on different games, different um, pitches that he Marcus Rashford's played for, different opposition, different weather conditions and so on, just to get them to see different aspects of what their favourite player has been doing to become a lot more better that way again it gives them that confidence and that's who they're trying to mirror but at the same time they're trying to mirror that player again Marcus Rashford for, uh, as an example I also try to get into them to become a better version of themselves take what Marcus does but also add your inner qualities and for me to understand those inner qualities I've got to speak to the player's parents I've got to speak to the player's club and more importantly, I've got to speak to the player. So if the player says, I can do this, okay, how can I design a session that's going to suit him or her on that level, as well as pluck in a Marcus Rashford or an Mbappe into their session? That way it gives them the confidence of they're mirroring their hero, but they're also creating a better version of themselves from their heroes. So for me, giving them that, that ownership and that and that power and obviously them seeing that I've done the research within them, that gives them that level, as you said, that confidence to go out there and try their, their, their hardest because you do see some sessions and I, I do watch a lot, a lot on, online of one-to-ones and it's repetitive, which is fantastic, but there doesn't seem to be that that sheer motivation where it's excitement that, 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 that they're performing, if, if that makes sense. And for me, I'm a big fan of excitement. I love football. I love going crazy at training and really geeing their players up and telling them how excited I, I was from the way they received the ball or the way they released the ball or the way they returned it under pressure. And then you see that their chest seems to rise higher and that gives them the, the motivation to even try even more and enjoy it even more and play with a smile on your face. And that is a key thing for me. Yeah, no, 100%. I think even some of the points picked up on there, like, it's true, you see so many one-to-one sessions where it's repetition, repetition, repetition. Don't get me wrong, it is important because yeah. of 
does help to become more confident and comfortable. However, like you said, adding that excitement in, adding variation in, and also I love the point about the um, the tablet. I know you mentioned it prior to this as well, but just having that extra thing there, it gives them that visual aid of this is what success looks like. And also as well, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. When you're looking at something like that, it's like, I want to do that. Like similar to, you know, you mentioned like the R9s. If you're a striker and back in the back in the day, you wanted to be um, an R9, I, I would watch, I mean, I wasn't a, I was a defender, but I would see, still watch like ways he strikes the ball. I'd still watch mm-hmm. like, skills that Ronaldinho would do. And you try and mirror it. You try and replicate it because ultimately it looks good. It looks cool. Yeah. It's interesting. So I do agree. I think, yeah, the, the visual aid of having examples of what players could achieve and what success looks like um, but then also as well adding in that excitement to really try and motivate and push these players on um, is, a, is, is a key factor and I just wanted to pick up on a point as well of when you do one-to-one sessions or, or 1v1 sessions what is the kind of process so again it kind of links back to the start of the conversation with the plan do review if a player necessarily isn't or not say isn't progressing but they don't quite get it would you then continue the similar learning or same learning in follow-on session? Um, or, you know, typically when I think of some one-to-one coaches, they do like a bit of a program where it'd be like, you know, first session with me, you do this, second session, you do that, third session, you do that. But how important do you reckon it is for um, when you are have got these players on their own that actually it's okay to carry on similar themes or learning throughout repetitive sessions almost? I think, again, I go back to that thing, I think the important parts when you're planning these one-to-one sessions is understanding by having that conversation with the parents Mm -hmm. and the club that that player is coming from. And even if they do not play for a common club, understanding how they learn at school is is, is huge. And again, as I work in a school, I know how important it is to hand that information over to, you know, different sports clubs who have that same child from your school. So having that balance and understanding that it's not just about the session that you've designed for the player, it's about understanding that player as much as possible because you don't have that player for the one-to-one every single day. So whatever you're doing away from um, that one-to-one session, it's down to you as a coach. Do your research to find different ways, having, you know, at least three plans, A, B or C, you know, because that player comes to you, that player could have, uh, have had a poor day at school that player could have had a poor day at college. You know, that player could have had a poor day regarding something personal. And all they want to do is train as much as possible, but they may not want to be able to vocally give as much today as they would have done last week. So having that understanding of a coach, right? Again, I go back to the social and the psychological factor. Having that awareness to know that first and foremost, as a human. And then secondly, right, okay, what is best for that human? So if I know that person comes from here, that person is educated there, their family is like this, they learn visually or verbally, and then mixing it up. And again, when it comes to reviewing each session, whether I've done it one-to-one or not, I still talk to people that I currently work with or people that I've worked with many years ago. So that way they can give me a good flavour of, have you tried this, Sherlin? Or have you tried that, Sherlin? Or that's a good point, Sherlin, but you might want to add into this because I've done X, Y, Z. So keeping that motivation there or finding different ways of motivating the the player essential or keeping the same session is is fine, but understanding what's important for that player at that current time. Because last week is last week and last week was fantastic. But this week is like, well, you know, little Jimmy's not really too happy about it or, you know, big Paul was not really too fussed about it because he's had a rough day. It's understanding first the player before you even get onto the grass to, to produce anything. And having plan A, B, or C for a, a mood of A, B, or C for each player, it, it, it can help. So it's all about the research and the planning for me as, as a coach going forward, because every scenario is very different. Yeah, no, I love that point as well about, you know, the external factors that may affect the mm-hmm. internal ones of the session. Because ultimately, like you said, you know, the player might not get something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to repeat the session again. No. 
be that actually, you know, they've had a bad day or, you know, they picked up an injury or really truthfully it's a cold night and, you know, <laughs> they just don't really want to be there because of the, the weather circumstances. So I think, yes, yeah, the, the key thing there is, like I said, understanding what the player actually needs. And I suppose if you understand that player, actually you can then look at the external factors which may be affecting this and you go, actually, do you know what? They don't usually act like this. This isn't the yeah. type of characteristics and, 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 and ways of, of doing things. So actually, you know, there's a problem. And also as well, stress. You know, sometimes the demands on the sessions and we don't realise it as coaches. I mean, oh, I'll never forget when I've done 1v1 sessions, so like they have a big group, I've done 1v1s. I kept on going for about four or five minutes. It wasn't until I tried to do that for four or five minutes and I was absolutely blowing. And I was like, how on earth have I just kept moving it? And obviously their motivation goes down after playing constantly like 1v1 to four minutes. So it's things like that, the demands on what we're asking players to do as well, I think can sometimes have an effect on the outcome of, you know, what we're trying to achieve as well. So, um, ab 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 Absolutely. You know, like you said, it's a key point, the stress and pressure. You know, you know, if we as adults feel pressure in different levels, whether it's, you know, paying your bills or getting up to go to work or, you know, even in games or sports that we, that we play in, you know, take, for example, football. I know if I was to put my football boots back on now and play the game, I'd enjoy it, but there's still that pressurised element of either I want to win or I want to make the correct tackle or I want to win the, you know, the correct pass. So I go back to something that I said earlier on. When we're coaching... We need to try and take that inner child within us and put it in our sessions too. Because when we were training back in the days, it was a case of repetition and so on, but we had our rough days too. So just because we're adults, it doesn't mean to say that the kids won't have their rough days because if we've experienced it, be sure that they've experienced it too. And I personally feel in today's football society, there's a lot of pressure on, on kids when it comes to football. And it's not just from the coaches, the club, the parents, the family. It's from the wider community that surrounds all those aspects of players and coach and, and parents. You know, and I do go back to the internet. The internet is, is, is basically the world for me. And these young people, they have so much access, better access than when I was growing up. For me, a text message was writing a note on a piece of paper and passing it to someone. Whereas now it's instant, it's instant likes, it's instant dislikes. And that alone, as a, a seven, eight-year-old or 10-year-old, seeing those things on your screen of someone disliking what you've done, that could be quite crushing. So the mood coming to the one-to-one -one session could be so low that you need to have, like I said, plan A, B or C. So again, it's all about understanding the player. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think, yeah, it boils down to it being a responsibility of us as coaches to to raise those motivational levels because ultimately as well, what you don't want it to become for the player is routine. That, you know, yeah. routine that they're continuously coming to the session, you you want the want from them. You want the the enjoyment from them. So, yeah, no, it's interesting. But back to your session, no, fantastic session. Um, I think sometimes coaches try to overcomplicate things and I think sometimes just keeping it nice and simple, um, adding in that variation as and when is needed um, and the repetition within it is key within bringing out any session. But, um, but yeah, no, fantastic session. Um, again, people in the comments below, let us know your thoughts, opinions on the session. Have you tried anything similar? What do you like to bring out as a coach or a player within a one-to-one -one session? Um, and some of the points we raise around motivation, how do you bring that out or what are you motivated by in a one-to-one -one session as well? But yeah, let us know your thoughts in um, in the box below. So that's the end of this week's Daily Coaching Football Show. I want to say a massive thank you um, and I really, really do appreciate Sherlin giving up his time today to join us. It's been some fun. No problem insight and discussion honestly your experience has been incredible to the knowledge of what we've talked talk about today there's been some really interesting topical points um and i think that yeah your your, your information and input has been vital um where can people come and get in contact with you to try and gain some more of this knowledge people can contact me on my instagram that's bello 78 that's b e w l o F I G O seven eight and on Twitter is Sherlin eight to sixteen. That's my first name S H E R L E N and A T O R and one six. 
Fantastic. Listen, anybody watching and listening to this, two things. Number one, make sure you go and give them a follow. And number two, um, not to flood your uh, inboxes too much, but get in touch. Okay. Honestly, there's been some fantastic insight and input into today's discussion. And honestly, I really, really do appreciate you giving up the time um, and being so honest and open and sharing that as well. So, yeah, massive thank you for taking the time and joining me today. I really, really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me, David. Anytime. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, again, make sure you subscribe to this channel as well so you don't miss out on any of the other episodes. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Take care and I'll see you soon.